welcome to the blue hour. So good to see all your faces or if your video's off, see all your names. Um, so great to have all of you here tonight. A um, couple of quick things. Um, if you, uh, you know, we offer this uh, reading series completely free of charge, but if you are so moved as to donate to the Poetry Center to help support this and other programs that Helene laid out, um, you can use that link and I'm gonna make it clickable. There you go, poetrycenter.org um, is a great way to donate. And uh, we're a small but mighty organization. Every little bit helps. Um, so what we're gonna do tonight is we are gonna hear from two amazing poets, uh, Carlina Duan and Lisa Lowe. So excited to have them joining us here tonight. Really excited to hear them share their work with us. Um, and then uh, we'll do a little Q and A right at the end for those of you who've been joining us. We'll be doing it the same way we always do, um, which is to say, if you have uh, questions, ideas, thoughts, curiosities, um, feel free to drop those in the chat box as we go through. I'll also make space for those at the end and I'll just pluck a couple out um, at the end to ask our wonderful featured poets based on how much time we have. Also really wanna encourage folks um, to respond to the poems in the chat box. We'll have everybody keep themselves on mute while the poems are being read. So the chat box is our place. You can also, if you know how, like do those little reaction-y things in, your, <laughs> in the corner of your screen, also welcomed. Um, so I think that's our logistical stuff. Um, as we head into creating this space together, we wanna to just take a moment um, as we lean into individual and collective growth to acknowledge um, who and what has come before. We wanna acknowledge that this event is being hosted on the unceded traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi nations. Also acknowledging that many other tribes, such as the Miami, the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, Sauk, and Fox also called this area home. This region has been for a long time a center for indigenous folks to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. And today, one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the U.S. resides here in Chicago, continuing to contribute to the vitality of the city and celebrating their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and the waterways. So in this moment, we invite you to explore the unceded homelands on which you find yourself as well, and take this moment to honor all who came before us, the indigenous peoples displaced by colonization, as well as those who built this country through uncompensated and compulsory labor, those enslaved and those oppressed. We honor those who came before us as we hold this shared space for art and expression. With that, I'm very excited to move us into that art and expression moment. And we're gonna start by uh, hearing from Carlina Duan. Um, she's a writer educator from Michigan and the author of the poetry collections, I Wore My Blackest Hair and Alien Miss. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, Narrative Magazine, Poets.org, The Rumpus and other publications. She received her MFA in poetry from Vanderbilt University. And she's currently a doctoral student in the University of Michigan's joint program in English and education. Among many things, she loves river walks, snail mail, and being a sister. I also want to take this moment to drop into the chat box where you can um, purchase her latest book. It's right there. Um, so join me, please, in welcoming Carlina. Oh, thank you so much, Marty. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, happy, happy Wednesday. I am over the moon thrilled to be here. And I'm so grateful to Chicago Poetry Center, to Marty, to Helene and Kundiman Midwest um, for just making this possible. And Lisa, I'm elated to share space with you and also with everyone who's here tonight and all of your cats and houseplants and all your home spaces. So thank you just for, for being present um, and for listening and collaborating together. Um, so I'm going to just read and I'm going to start my timer so I don't go over time, but I'm going to read um, a few poems tonight. And a few of those poems are actually from my most recent book, um, Alien Miss, which is right here, which actually just celebrated its um, 
birthday. It's been out for about one year now as of like earlier last week. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from this book. Um, and this was a book that I created thinking largely about questions around intergenerational history and sort of lineage, um, a lineage of joy within uh, Chinese American diaspora and movement and um, migration to uh, this land. And it's also not lost on me that today is the year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings. And so I've been thinking about um, the women um, and thinking about language as a possible site for reparative care. Um, and so the poem that I'm going to start with today is called, uh, Do You Have a Grammatically Correct Response to the Question? And this poem, um, it kind of uses almost like a Mad Lib form. Um, and so there will be moments where I pause in the poem. And when I pause, I'll just invite you to imagine a kind of blank line, almost like a fill in the blank. Um, and so again, this is a poem that's thinking very specifically about language, the possibility of language as care um, versus language as, as violence and linguistic violence. Do you have a grammatically correct response to the question? And remember the time I stood at the intersection carrying my black suit of hair and the woman stopped in her shiny car, rolled down her window to scream something vulgar, something clinking inside her mouth, a word, a system of grammar flipped to fury, red, ripe, railing, at me? For what? My body? My attention? Anger is often in response to a boundary crossed. What was that boundary? Where were my legs? Why did I stand there without a word, holding the straw in my ice cubed drink as the liquid turned warm and illegible between these jaws? Slosh, slosh. The woman stopped in her shiny car. The woman stopped to scream, you, in her shiny car at me. Who is the subject of this sentence? Who is the object? What is the verb? Standard English grammar dictates the proper tense. Do I care about the proper? She spat at me. She said a bad word. A string of words demarcating my body, hit by grammar, hit by a field of letters, hid behind a lump in my throat while my body remained my body. My lungs pulled up the hot July air. My hair remained parted to the side as I clasped the straw, as I watched the tips of my feet, a body to be screamed at by a stranger. July, North American, a street. Which tense would you like to use to describe the incident above? The past, the future. I will eat leaves and pour vinaigrette slow and skinny. I will feed the low opal of my mouth. In times of distress, I will turn on the stove. Garlic will be fried in a river of yellow oil. I will eat my letters, crunchy and fat, angry and swollen, soft and slathered in old fashioned oats. I will try to pull up the words. Hit me, she did. Hurt me, I am. Language, she did. The word, I am, am not. On a North American street, on a hot July day, a woman stopped her car where I waited at an intersection to tell me I was a. On a North American street, on a hot July day, a woman stopped her car where I waited at an intersection to scream the word. Later, I wilted leaves in a hot pan. Later, I fed the story back to my mouth. Later, the syntax was rewound in a reel, set aside, and I composed a new body of Roman letters out my body. I pulled up words from their waggling roots and raised them to touch the edges of a face, a page, to cure and hold and praise and wriggle and snap and sister and alive, amen, and alive, amen, then defy and defy and talk back. That's that first poem. Um, 
Thank you so much for, for listening. And yeah, I was just thinking a lot about sort of what it means to cultivate um, language as a site of care. Um, the next poem that I'm going to read is, um, I'm actually, sorry, I'm just changing my mind at last minute. I'm gonna read something that's a little bit different. Um, this is a poem that's, that's not in the book, um, but I've been thinking also about teachers and teachers in the past few years, especially who have had to teach online and teach on Zoom and also the tenderness of moments. Um, uh, that can happen and also the labor of, of teaching online. So this is a poem that, I, that I'm writing kind of in honor of teachers. So if there's any teachers in the room who have had to teach on Zoom, um, I love you, I'm grateful for you. Um, and this is a poem about my experiences teaching uh, online as well. So it's called bzz, bzz, like buzz, buzz, bzz, 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 I am tired. <laughs> so this is a poem in the spirit of that. Bzz, bzz, I am tired. So I smile another fake smile into a box and tell my students to take a screen break five minutes while I pace near my window begging for magnolia buds to bust open already and save me from another day full of my own pixelated image talking meaningless loops around a screen. Puff, puff, go the clouds. Blah, blah, go my lips while my body pulses. Bzz, bzz. Someday, I will watch the ocean flip full of fish with silver bellies. Someday, I will pluck a stem off its branch and sniff to identify the loot. Someday, in this big, fragrant, busy world, again, I will kiss a friend on her cheek and feel her baby curl her tiny fingers around my thumb. Today in a mask while walking down the street, I watched sparrows flit beneath the hood of a car and a cardinal cross the sky, red stamp. I savor other bodies in flight, store up the feeling. Boy, oh boy, look at the scooters and chalk art of hopscotch grids or stars gliding past another patch of pavement. Oh, discarded crumb. Oh, donut shop across the street. Oh, to be dunking the communal shovel into a bulk food spin again, remembering the sound of brown sugar falling into a paper bag. Yet here I go, back at my screen. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Try to lift but flop. Oh well. Tomorrow, once more, I'll speak into an abyss of meaningless dark squares. Listen up, I'll say. Listen up. <laughs> so that's kind of a, <laughs> a silly poem, but in celebration of all the teaching that's had to happen across screens over the past few years. Um, I'm just going to read like two more um, poems. Um, and the next one that I'm reading is from a series um, of of longer poems that I have in the book called um, The Alien Mist Poems. And um, specifically with the Alien Mist Poems, I was thinking about writing into the genre of the documentary. And so using actually source texts and embedding um, those source historical source texts within the language of the poem itself. And so this particular poem um, references the Angel Island Immigration Station um, and also the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And I borrowed text um, from um, specifically from an 1885 broadside letter uh, that was addressed to the President of the United States into Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress. And the letter was an open letter again, titled Protest Against Ill Treatment of the Chinese. And it was published in 1885. Um, so this is a poem that's sort of thinking around um, the, the kind of history of Chinese ex exclusion in, in the United States. It's called Alien Miss Consults Her Past. Alien Miss Consults Her Past. On Angel Island, she finds a bolt of blue linen cloth, moles on the chest, boats, men who boarded them, bound for a golden country to pave, to stave off hunger, labor, what's an American dream but a debt, a price to pay, how to say, longing, longing, oh, say, can you see, vowels, opened, bare feet hitting the grass, lawn sprawls of land, touching foot to ground, foot to hardwood floor, water, then water, then more water, 
slats of light against a lawn wall, saying her own name to a room, holding a pool of water on the tongue, saying her own name to a tree, to another head, its river of hair matted on the pillow, barred from entry, barred from country, barred while carrying a chain link fence, lawful, feral, fearful, what's in the past is in the past is in the past, quote, that these threats and intimidations and riotous bloody acts in this nation which claims to be a leading nation in intelligence, morality, and culture shock our sense of national pride. The past is in the future, the future in a woman who strips down before crawling into a barracks lonely bed. Above her, the cloth hangs to dry, goosebumps on the skin, practices saying the words out loud by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed, what so proudly we hailed, what so proudly, so proudly, so, so, oh. And that's that poem. So thank you for listening. Um, I have one more final poem um, to kind of close out my set. And thank you so much again for just being here and sharing space. This last piece is called Possible and it references a Sally Rooney novel. <laughs> um, so this is possible. Possible. Now my dress smells like rain and all day long, I've been eager to get back to my book a novel about a young couple making pasta and falling into one another's skin, an Irish novel with names of cities that clunk around in my mouth, cities I'd never heard of, but now ride my skull like pleasant individually wrapped candies, words with strange cactus-like shapes, words I star, Sligo, Curriculae, I turn the page, my mind goes stick, 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 my brain goes, hungry for more. Today I run through the rain in my wooden clogs and pleasure at the sound. Thump, 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 the entire green world of a street flashing down an open sewer drain. So alive, I think, then remember what else makes me possible. Public libraries, cartilage, a good hardcover, a prayer I overhear my cab driver, uh, excuse me, my cab driver mumble while passing by a full school bus. Goosebumps I get from reading my old journal, one sentence, another, my heart is a skull zone. Did I really write that? And oh, I am possible again. I am a fragrant, silly self. Today, I thank the worms who eat the dirt, who break down the soil, who make the lilacs possible and young, forever purpling, forever cradled in my palms as I cross Blakemore Avenue and it rains, 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 and I think about eating up the alphabet, which has made a city into a word, into a sound, Sligo, which slides slinky-like into my brain. The dear alphabet, which has made me into a woman who will cross the street and love the lilacs and treasure the strange turn of the day, the strange turn of a word, a sentence, a curve, and a stroke of black ink that, thank you, brought me here. Thank you all so much for listening um, and just for sharing space. I'm so excited to hear you read, Lisa, and I'm just so grateful to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, everyone wants, if everybody wants to unmute and applaud and yay and holler and whatever. Woo! <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yay. Oh, yay. oh. oh lovely. Great, so wonderful. Okay, I am so excited to um, bring on our next reader, Lisa Lowe. Lisa Lowe's poems appear or are forthcoming in Copper Nickel, Ecotone, the Massachusetts Review, Poetry, the Southern Review, and elsewhere. And her nonfiction won the 2020 Gulf Coast Nonfiction Prize. She graduated from Indiana University's MFA program and is currently a PhD student at the University of Cincinnati and associate editor at the Cincinnati Review. Her debut chapbook, Crown for the Girl Inside, won the 2020 Vinyl 45 Chapbook Contest and is forthcoming from Yes Yes Books. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Lowe.
Thank you so much. Um, Carlina, that was so amazing. Um, yeah, just feeling chill still. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful to be with you all. Um, Marty, thank you so much for hosting. Helene, also for planning. Um, and just Kuniman and Chicago Poetry Center also. Um, and also Tina for captioning. Um, I lived in Chicago for a few years after undergrad, um, so it has a special place in my heart. Um, I'm gonna start with some Ars Poeticas and they're all called Ars Poetica. <laughs> Ars Poetica. For years, I used the body of my younger self as proof racism exists. I placed her into the blank space of a poem as if no one would see her. She let me arrange her like that, sitting on her hands, thighs suctioned to a folding chair. What audience doesn't wanna see a girl sweat? She glistens like evidence shown from all angles. I wouldn't let her friends into the poem. I left a box of tissues outside the frame. I gave her the open ceiling of a poem through which she could be looked at as long as you want. Um, let me change my view to gallery view. I'm just looking at one person's blank name. Okay. <laughs> Ars Poetica. A few years ago, I placed my younger self into a poem dreaming of a potato chip flavored kiss. All American kisses occurred in lives where candy bars and sleeping with their hair wet were also permitted where the attention of American mothers cast a soft glow through the house and clicked off at night. I titled the poem, Lisa and These White Girls. The speaker of the poem, who hadn't yet felt the thrill and discomfort of saying white in white spaces, is described through a litany of her desires. Anaphora replaces plot resolution. In place of an ending, a break. Our girl can only have so many desires before she must look up out of the poem to breathe. After reading the poem, a writing teacher asked me, don't white girls also envy Lisa? What about the white girl at the back of the room no one sits next to? You mean Lisa also envies her? In a world with envy, a girl achieves success attaining the objects of everyone's desires. If she works hard enough, she can become an object of desire herself. Her teachers, her classmates, believe in an image of her quietly working hard. She enters the image and feels its contour snap onto her like a cat suit. In the girl's mind, the teacher's voice starts to sound like her own. In the poem, the speaker wears a tiger on her sweater. The gold embroidery makes her braver than in real life. The tiger, the gold thread, the red satin tongue cannot be seen beneath the list of desires. The girl's face is underneath the girl's face. Ars Poetica. After not showing in a poem how I once was boring, I spent weeks collecting proof from my past for readers who wanted to know. I have difficulty deciding the best prop for my poem. A, from the outside, the crack of a bathroom stall framing a girl's eye. B, an unmoving sleeping bag. C, a shaky piece of paper or hand. D, sunspots in the ceiling of a girl's closed eyelids. What is the shape of the girl's body in the sleeping bag and how long can she remain unmoving? Is she sleeping or pretending to sleep? Someone might wonder. I don't know whether to prefer the girl's body seen. Yes, hers is like yours or unseen. You already know what it looks like, yours. On the other hand, her body must appear at least a little unlike yours. The previous ending to this poem released the girl from having to appear in future poems of mine. Go, I tell her and picture her filling the ceiling with peelable stars. I didn't wanna change the lines that relieved me from question answering and gave me hope. I pictured one day wanting to write about the girl again, reversing myself. In the original version, no one sees her, not even to look at her wrongly. The bedroom ceiling above her recalls the earlier ceiling, a space in the mind. In my mind, she hasn't yet become the weakest point on her body. In the poem, I keep feeling the walls for another ending for her. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears um, to one of my favorite writing topics, which is um, being with a white guy. Um, this poem is um, inspired by a joke from Ali Wong's first special, Baby Cobra. I'm sure many of y'all have seen it. Mail order groom. I flip through a catalog of mail order grooms. I want one from a colonizing country. The whiter, the better. I want the hair and disposition of a golden retriever. 
I want money sprouting from his follicles like Rapunzel. I want him soft. I want him strong and soft like a rope of hair, like toilet paper. I want his last name changed to mine. I want to buy one, give one another a white husband for a friend. When he comes to me, I want him to kneel between my legs like he's expecting to represent his entire race. Um, and then I'm just gonna finish out with this long piece. Um, it's like a lyric essay type of prose poem. Um, so yeah, it'll just take me to the end. Um, and yeah, there are excerpts and it's called People Who Look Like You. The feeling of a tall white man beside you gives you power or takes from it, depending on circumstance. The sun reaches him first, illuminating, illuminating him so a shadow casts over you. Is it warmth that you want or shade? Is this circumstance or perspective? It is important to remember, whether you're partially or fully outside the shadow, it can only bob alongside you. Shade only works when you stand close enough to want it. What is the difference between shade and shadow besides a pair of running legs? A tall white man beside you makes you appear smaller than you are. So when you're without him, you feel larger, your size again. This too is the kind of power of shape-shifting. The superpower of a white man is the ability to wear basketball shorts at any moment, anywhere. You count the times, the places, you wear basketball shorts. This looks like the beginning of a joke, but is, if you look closer, a math problem, a problem to solve. If only you can feel like a tall white man, not just his tallness beside you, you decide to practice and keep practicing this intellectual exercise. You cannot have his voice, his shoulders, the length of his arms or the body that has been loved for centuries. There are many things you could do with this love. There are many things you already do that need effort to make look effortless. You track the proliferation of white male Asian female couples on the street, in your friend groups, on your Instagram explore page. Ha ha, you think when you see one, as if reacting to a bad joke. You love dumplings and imagine hosting a dumpling making party where your apartment fills with all the Asian white couple friends you know, past and present. A literary hero of yours and her husband could be the guest of honor. A the tall white man flanked by other white men who follow his instruction peels a dumpling wrapper from the stack. Friends take turns scooping, dipping, pleading, sealing, while the rest gossip in the background like mirrors. In your mind, the gathering takes on the varnished feeling of science fiction. The trope of beautiful Asian women dating ugly white guys troubles you, but you look around the room at all your beautiful Asian girlfriends and the white men who vary in both attractiveness and social skills. Dumplings are everywhere when the room erupts in laughter the punchline of someone's story that you missed. You automatically laugh too, like you can't help stepping into the space the world has made for you. Even after a tall white man says, I love you, you know that in theory, he could crush you with a little effort. A white man's anger has both short-term and long-term power. Therefore, it is important to determine the ways you could crush a white man yourself in emergencies. This takes some creative thinking. While others may think this is violence, to you, it is self-defense and exit strategy. A red sign you don't unplug from the wall. On hearing your ways to crush a white man or even that you're thinking of these ways, a white man may feel hurt, alarm, defensiveness or anger, the very emotion that led you here it then becomes your job to comfort him. You say, this is the distance between us, the world we live in, that you must comfort a white man while protecting yourself is another day's problem to solve. The quietness of a tall white man is an underrated power, the power to move space, to make space. You love the quietness of the tall white man whose shirt sleeves aren't long enough to reach his wrists. There's something vulnerable about a white man with long arms and uncovered wrists. This isn't the only vulnerable thing you love about him. So even though you don't mean to be with a white man, you stick around to know him better. One day you buy the tall white man shirts with extra long sleeves. This is the first time since childhood the whole lengths of his arms fit. His happiness touches you in his creepy red house with not much natural light. The problem of being with a white man belongs only to you, not to the white man with whom you share this problem. This itself becomes a problem. One only you will bring up a problem you see that he doesn't. You periodically email the tall white man articles on current events involving people like you, current events in your parents' home country, racism against people like you. 
he is busy and forgets, or he has a bad week and forgets. When you remind him he is earnestly sorry, promises to read immediately. You look for a pattern like a nagging mother for when behaviors resolve on their own. At church, the tall white man is mistaken for the white husband of another Asian white couple um, that you know. You laugh together over his first experience of what has happened to you countless times. This is graciousness born of privilege, you realize, a fact you laugh at too. Researching the history of Asian white couples, you crawl into bed after clicking through to Reddit from another article. The article was good, the Reddit comments expect, expected. Although you are good and did not click view entire discussion, the phrase racist toxic WMAF couples loops itself in your brain. The tall white man journals a nightly ritual after hugging you and clicks off the light. If you could reach far enough, you could touch the pink meat where the words have been etched. That's it, thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you so much, Lisa. If everyone wants to unmute for a quick moment and hoot and har and pink and really nice. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. So great. We have a few minutes for a Q&A. If anybody has a question or curiosity, please feel free to drop it in the chat box. Um, Nothing is popping up. So I'm going to go ahead and ask a quick question to the two, and then we'll have time for one or two others. Um, you both engage um, sort of the, the personal narrative and the historical narrative, right? Like we're all located in our time and in the time before our time. And I'm, I'm wondering how, in, how intentional that is in your work or whether that's something that um, sort of just emerges in your in your writing process, how that works for you. Yeah, I can I can start if that's okay, Lisa. Um, yeah, I think for me it's very intentional. Um, I I feel that um, for me, like when I when I first started writing poetry, um, I was really young, and I think that um, it was really interesting to watch the ways that the poets that I really loved, I think, were doing the work of extending what I found in my history textbooks or extending sort of the language that I would see around me in different ways. And poetry was actually a space where I felt like, in some ways, um, the narratives that were bound up in what I was reading in school were actually kind of stretched out um, and were able to even be like, you know, they were inviting me to look in a different way. Um, and so I think for me, when I write my own poems, I'm actually almost always thinking about um, history and thinking about lineage and sort of how I've arrived into the space and the body that I've arrived towards um, because of the long line of um, people and spaces and plate and land, you know, that has come before me. Um, and so to me, I, I almost see it at poetry um, in conversation with all of my lineages, whether those are creative lineages, familial, um, you know, environmental. Um, so history is kind of both you know, at the forefront of my mind. And then it's also in the way that I almost like feel like I'm moving through through the world in some ways as well. Um, and so, yeah, I love that question, Marty. Thank you for that question, Lisa. I'm so curious what, what, what you think as well. Thanks, Carolina. Yeah, that was really wonderful. I'm not sure if, ever, if I have a very good answer myself, um, but I think what I tend to do is I write more personally um, and then I struggle to incorporate like the larger historical context um, or feel like I need to write um, historical context in a specific kind of way in order for it to seem, um, I don't know, um, more legitimate or something. Um, so yeah, definitely struggling with that balance uh, myself. Um, I think I often find that maybe I don't um, incorporate it into my work um, intentionally, but then just like reading stuff will just like kind of filter um, in a little bit. Um, and I think Carlina, you were talking a little bit about this um, in terms of like personal history, family history. So like just thinking of the different kinds of histories um, that are available to me as a writer um, and just like being in my family, um, being part of the community, larger community. Um, I think that's really helpful when I think in terms of um, the personal and the historical. Awesome. Great. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to go with GS's question um, as our second question, because I feel like it sort of expands on what we were just talking about. Um, 
and they ask about, so there's you know, subjects we gravitate, gravitate towards writing about, and then a slightly smaller voice that doesn't always get written out or about. And, and the question is around like, what, is there like a subject or theme that you want to write more about? But maybe, and I'm gonna add on, but are like challenged about or feel like you don't have access to, um, but that's sort of like that underneath, yeah. Either both, you're like, you're like, okay, spill your secrets. What have you always wanted to write about, but not managed to? <laughs> Yeah, um, this is such a great question. Thank you so much, GS. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think about this in terms of, um, I guess the way I'll respond to this is in terms of what I am trying to write towards right now in newer work, but feel that in some ways I feel a little bit stuck. Um, I'm trying to write um, more into the world of like eco poetics and so more specifically about kind of, um, I guess, environment sort of land science and sort of the way my body as an Asian American body kind of um, positions itself amidst all of that and I find myself feeling really stuck and I think part of it is because I feel almost a sense of um, there's so much to say that I don't really even know where to begin. Um, and so recently I actually just started reading um, Dear Memory by Victoria, uh, Victoria, yeah, Victoria Chang, um, Victoria Chang. I'm having that brain fart moment where I'm like, is it Victoria <laughs> Chang? <laughs> um, but I'm reading this book called Dear Memory and I started it this morning and I, it's like blowing me away. And she has this um, epistolary, like this kind of letter, um, form of letter writing poem um, or lyric essay in the, in the beginning of the book and it's called Dear Silence. And so in that particular piece, she starts to kind of write towards like the silence to write towards what she feels like she cannot possibly say. And she almost personifies silence and silence becomes a sort of pressure point for thinking about um, how do I coexist with you in my world? And to me, I think when I think about like whatever future body of poems I'm gonna write next, um, whether it's in the world of, you know, ecopoetics and, and environment or not, um, I think about how I can invite myself to lean into the silences that I'm feeling right now, to lean into the stuck space um, and to almost, I loved when I read uh, this, this lyric essay, Dear Silence, um, that this poet is actually just, you know, speaking directly to silence, inviting that silence and that stuckness into her life. So that's something that I'm thinking about as I feel also a little bit wedged in terms of what's gonna be, what's, what's next. Um, and I also haven't been writing, I'll say I haven't really been writing as many poems in the past two years. Um, since Alien Mist came out, um, I have felt a little bit, you know, adrift in terms of searching for what's coming next. And so I'm excited for whatever future wayward poems come my way, but I've been a little bit, um, I've been a little stuck recently. And so, I'll, yeah, I'll just kind of leave it, leave it at that. I mean, what's been going on in the last two years that you wouldn't be writing a lot of poems, you know? I mean, <laughs> okay, thanks so much. How about you, Lisa? Yeah, I really love that. Um, and also, Carlina, thank you for going first. It allowed my brain to <laughs> its gears. Um, yeah, I think one topic that I'm really interested in um, recently that I've been kind of struggling to write about, I've like written like a little bit, but then just like put it aside for a while um, is jealousy. Um, so I'm really interested um, in just like these like negative emotions um, that are um, like versus like, I don't know, stress or like, um, I don't know. I think even anxiety, I think, is more discussed um, uh, in the public sphere. Um, so just like in terms of like professional jealousy, personal jealousy between friends, I'm really interested in. Um, I wrote about apologies um, one time, and I think like going in that direction, but that felt easier to me too, um, in terms of like thinking about like um, self-complicity and like reflection um, on the self. But yeah, that's a topic that I'm really interested in. And um, yeah, I'm gonna keep trying to work at it. Um, so great. These are, there's such good poem, uh, such good questions in the chat box, but I want to honor our 715 at Central. Uh, end time. Um, I, the questions are so good that I feel like we should have like a blog or something where we do a Q&A after this, but you know, 
Helene and I will talk about that later. Um, in the meantime, uh, Maureen asked if it's too late to sign up for the workshop right after this. Normally it would be, but we actually have some space tonight. Um, so Maureen, uh, email me, email curator at poetrycenter.org and I'll send you the link. I'm gonna put it poetrycenter.org. Actually just send it to me, Marty. It all goes to me, okay. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, what a wonderful night. Thank you hugely, hugely to Carlina and Lisa for being here and sharing your amazing brilliance and light. Um, so, so wonderful. Um, we will be back again in April, uh, the third Wednesday in April, um, when our features will be uh, Keisha Coopers and uh, TBD. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. We will let you know uh, what we're doing for National Poetry Month. Um, have a wonderful night.